Welcome back, friends, to another gentle reading. Tonight we'll begin to indulge with my personal favorite piece of historiography, The Discovery and Conquest of Mexico by Bernal Diaz. Why is it my personal favorite? Mostly because it was written as a counterpoint to Cortez's own biography, and I find that fascinating. But also, the book reads so much like a novel that it was, in fact, adopted as a novel, with a couple of syllables chopped out of every name and a few token elves thrown in for good measure. But we're reading the original today. I hope you enjoy it. Book Two, The Conquest. Chapter One, The Expedition Under Cortez. After the return of the Captain Juan de Grijalva to Cuba, when the governor Diego Velasquez understood how rich were these newly discovered lands, he ordered another fleet, much larger than the former one, to be sent off, and he had already collected in the port of Santiago, where he resided, ten ships, four of them were those in which he had returned with Juan de Grijalva, which had at once been careened, and the other six had been got together from other ports on the island. He had them furnished with provisions, consisting of cassava bread and salt pork. These provisions were only to last until we arrived at Havana, for it was at that port that we were to take in our stores, as was afterwards done. I must cease talking of this and tell about the disputes which arose over the choice of a captain for the expedition. There were many debates, and much opposition. Most of us soldiers who were there said that we should prefer to go again under Juan de Grijalva, for he was a good captain, and there was no fault to be found either with his person or his capacity for command. While things were going on in the way I have related, two great favorites of Diego Velasquez, named Ander de Duero, and the governor's secretary, and Amador de Lares, his majesty's accountant, secretly formed a partnership with a gentleman named Hernando Cortez, a native of Medellin, who held a grant of Indians in the island. A short while before, Cortez had married a lady named Catalina Juarez La Marcaeda. As far as I know, and from what others say, it was a love match. I will go on to tell about this partnership. It came about in this manner. These two great favorites of Velasquez agreed that they would get him to appoint Cortez Captain General of the whole fleet, and that would divide between the three of them the spoil of gold, silver, and jewels, which might fall to Cortez's share. For secretly Diego Velasquez was sending to trade, and not to form a settlement, as was apparent afterwards from the instructions given about it, although it was announced and published that the expedition was for the purpose of founding a settlement. Andre de Duero drew up the documents in very good ink, as the proverb says, in the way Cortez wished, with very ample powers. As soon as Hernando Cortez had been appointed general, he began to search for all sorts of arms, guns, powder, and crossbows, and every kind of warlike stores which he could get together, and all sorts of articles to be used for barter, and other things necessary for the expedition. Moreover, he began to adorn himself, and be more careful of his appearance than before, and he wore a plume of feathers with a medal and a gold chain and a velvet cloak trimmed with knots of gold. In fact, he looked like a gallant and courageous captain. However, he had no money to defray the expenses I have spoken about, for at that time he was very poor and much in debt, although he had a good encomienda of Indians who were getting him a return from his gold mines. But he spent all of it on his person and on finery for his wife, whom he had recently married, and on entertaining some guests who had come to visit him. For he was affable in his manner and a good talker, and he had twice been chosen alcalde of the town of Santiago Baracoa, where he had settled, and in that country it is esteemed a great honor to be chosen as alcalde. When some merchant friends of his saw that he had obtained this command as captain general, they lent him four thousand gold dollars in coin, and gave him merchandise worth another four thousand dollars secured on his Indians and estates. Then he ordered two standards and banners to be made, worked in gold with the royal arms and a cross on each side with a legend which said, Comrades, let us follow the sign of the Holy Cross with true faith, and through it we shall conquer. 
and he ordered a proclamation to be made with the sound of drums and trumpets, in the name of his majesty, and by Diego Velasquez in the king's name, and in his own as captain general, to the effect that whatsoever person might wish to go in his company to the newly discovered lands to conquer them and to settle there, should receive his share of the gold, silver, and riches which might be gained, and an encomienda of Indians after the country had been pacified, and that to do these things did Diego Velasquez held authority from his majesty. We assembled at Santiago de Cuba, whence we set out with the fleet more than three hundred and fifty soldiers in number. From the house of Velasquez there came Diego de Orda, the chief mayor domo, whom Velasquez himself sent with orders to keep his eyes open and see that no plots were hatched in the fleet, for he was always distrustful of Cortez, although he concealed his fears. There came also Francisco de Morla and an Escobar, whom we called the Page, and a Heredia, and Juan Ramo, and Pedro Escudero, and Martin Ramos de Lares, and many others who were friends and followers of Diego Velasquez. And I placed myself last on the list, for I also came from the house of Diego Velasquez, for he was my kinsman. Cortez worked hard to get his fleet under way, and hastened on his preparations, for already envy and malice had taken possession of the relations of Diego Velasquez, who were affronted because their kinsmen neither trusted them nor took any notice of them, and because he had given charge and command to Cortez, knowing that he had looked upon him as a great enemy only a short time before, on account of his marriage. So they went about grumbling at their kinsman Diego Velasquez, and at Cortez, and by every means in their power they worked on Diego Velasquez to induce him to revoke the commission. Now Cortez was advised of all this, and for that reason never left the governor's side, and always showed himself to be his zealous servant, and kept on telling him that, God willing, he was going to make him a very illustrious and wealthy gentleman in a very short time. Moreover, Andre de Duero was always advising Cortez to hasten the embarkation of himself and his soldiers, for Diego Velasquez was already changing his mind, owing to the importunity of his family. When Cortez knew this, he sent orders to his wife that all provisions of food which he wished to take, and any other gifts, such as women usually give to their husbands when starting on such an expedition, should be sent at once and placed on board ship. He had already had a proclamation made that on that day, by nightfall, all ships, captains, pilots, and soldiers should be on board, and no one should remain on shore. When Cortez had seen all his company embarked, he went to take leave of Diego Velasquez, accompanied by his great friends and many other gentlemen, and all the most distinguished citizens of that town. After many demonstrations and embraces of Cortez by the governor, and of the governor by Cortez, he took his leave. The next day, very early after having heard mass, we went to our ships, and Diego Velasquez himself accompanied us, and again they embraced with many fair speeches, one to the other, until we set sail. A few days later, in fine weather, we reached the port of Trinidad, where we brought up in the harbor and went ashore, and nearly all the citizens of that town came out to meet us and entertained us well. From that town there came to join us five brothers, namely Pedro de Alvarado and Jorge de Alvarado, and Gonzalo and Gomez, and Juan de Alvarado the Elder, who was a bastard. There also joined us from this town Alonso de Avila, who went as a captain in Grijalva's expedition, and Juan de Escalante, and Pedro Sanchez Farafan, and Gonzalo Mejia, who later on became treasurer in Mexico, and a certain Baena, and Juan Nes of Fuentarabia, and... Lares, the good horseman, and Cristobal de Olid, the valiant, and Ortiz, the musician, and Gaspar Sanchez, nephew of the treasurer of Cuba, and Diego de Pineda, and Alonso Rodriguez, and Bortolome Garcia, and other gentlemen whose names I do not remember, all persons of quality. From Trinidad, Cortes wrote to the town of Santi Spiritus, which was eighteen leagues distant, informing all the inhabitants that he was setting out on this expedition in his majesty's service, adding fair words and inducements to attract many persons of quality who had settled in that town. Among them, Alonso Hernández Puerto Carrero, cousin of the Count of Medellín, and Gonzalo de Sandoval and Juan Velázquez de León came, a kinsman of Diego Velázquez, and Rodrigo Reogel and Gonzalo López de Jimena, and his brother, and Juan Cedeño also came, all these distinguished persons whom I have named came from the town of Santa Spiritus to Trinidad, 
and Cortez went out to meet with them, all the soldiers of his company, and received them with great cordiality, and they treated him with the highest respect. We continued to enlist soldiers and to buy horses, which at that time were both scarce and costly, and as Alonso Hernández Puerto Carrero neither possessed a horse, nor the wherewithal to buy one, Hernando Cortez bought him a gray mare, and paid for it with some of the golden knots off the velvet cloak, which, as I have said, he had had made at Santiago de Cuba. At that very time a ship arrived in port from Havana, which a certain Juan Cedeno, a settler at Havana, was taking, freighted with cassava bread and salt pork to sell at some gold mines near Santiago de Cuba. Juan Cedeno landed and went to pay his respects to Cortez, and after a long conversation Cortez bought the ship and the pork and bread on credit, and it all came with us, so we already had eleven ships, and thank God all was going well with us. I must go back a little from our story to say that after we had set out from Santiago de Cuba with all the ships, so many things were said to Diego Velasquez against Cortez that he was forced to change his mind, for they told him that Cortez was already in rebellion, and that he left the port by stealth, and that he had been heard to say that although Diego Velasquez and his relations might regret it, he intended to be captain, and that was the reason why he had embarked all his soldiers by night, so that if any attempt were made to detain him by force, he might set sail. Those who took the leading part in persuading Diego Velasquez to revoke the authority he had given to Cortez were some members of the Velasquez family, and an old man named Juan Milan, whom some called the astrologer, but others said he had a touch of madness because he acted without reflection, and this old man kept repeating to Diego Velasquez, Take care, sir, for Cortez will take vengeance on you for putting him in prison, and as he is sly and determined, he will ruin you if you do not prevent it at once. And Velasquez listened to these speeches, and was always haunted by suspicions, so without delay he sent two messengers whom he trusted, with orders and instructions to Francisco Verdugo, the chief alcalde of Trinidad, who was his brother-in-law, to the effect that on no account should the fleet be allowed to sail, and he said in his orders that Cortes should be detained or taken prisoner, as he was no longer its captain, for he had revoked his commission and given it to Vasco Porcayo. The messengers also carried letters to Diego de Orda and Francisco de Morla and other dependents of his, begging them not to allow the fleet to sail. When Cortes heard of this, he spoke to Orda and Francisco Verdugo, and to all the soldiers and settlers at Trinidad, whom he thought would be against him and in favor of the instructions, and he made such speeches and promises to them that he brought them over to his side. Diego Orda himself spoke at once to Francisco Verdugo, the alcalde mayor, advising him to have nothing to do with the affair, but to hush it up, and bade him note that up to that time they had seen no change in Cortes, on the contrary that he showed himself to be a faithful servant of the governor, and that if Velasquez wished to impute any evil law on him, in order to deprive him of the command of the fleet, it was as well to remember that Cortes had many men of quality among his friends, who were unfriendly to Velasquez, because he had not given them good grants of Indians. In addition to this, that Cortes had a large body of soldiers with him, and was very powerful, and might sow strife in the town, and perhaps the soldiers might sack the town and plunder it, and do even worse damage. So the matter was quietly dropped and one of the messengers who brought the letters and instructions joined our company, and by the other messenger Cortez sent a letter to Diego Velasquez, written in a friendly manner, saying that he was amazed at his honor having come to such a decision, that his desire was to serve God and his majesty, and to obey him as his majesty's representative, and that he prayed him not to pay any more attention to what was said by the gentlemen of his family, nor to change his mind on account of the speeches of such an old lunatic as Juan Millan. He also wrote to all his friends, and especially to his partners, Duero and the treasurer. When these letters had been written, Cortes ordered all the soldiers to polish up their arms, and he ordered the blacksmiths in the town to make headpieces, and the crossbowmen to overhaul their stores and make arrows, and he also sent for the two blacksmiths and persuaded them to accompany us, which they did. We were ten days in that town. When Cortes saw that there was nothing more to be done at the town of Trinidad, he sent Pedro de Alvarado by land to Havana to pick up some soldiers who lived on farms along the road, and I went in his company, and he sent all the horses by land. 
Cortez then went on board the flagship to set sail with all the fleet for Havana. It appears that the ships of the convoy lost sight of the flagship in the night time, and we all arrived at the town of Havana. But Cortez did not appear, and no one knew where he was delayed. Five days passed without news of his ship, and we began to wonder whether he had been lost. We all agreed that three of the smaller vessels should go in search of Cortez, and in preparing the vessels in a debates whether this or the other man, Pedro or Sancho, should go, two more days went by and Cortez did not appear. Then parties began to be formed, and we all played the game of who shall be captain until Cortez comes. Let us leave this subject and return to Cortez. In the neighborhood of the Isle of Pines, or near the Hadines, where there are many shallows, his ship ran aground and remained there hard and fast and could not be floated. Cortez ordered all the cargo which could be removed to be taken ashore in the boat, for there was land nearby where it could be stored, and when it was seen that the ship was floating and could be moved, she was taken into deeper water and was laden again with the cargo. Sail was then set, and the voyage continued to the port of Havana. When Cortez arrived, nearly all of his gentlemen and soldiers who were awaiting him were delighted at his coming, all except some who had hoped to be captains, for the game of choosing captains came to an end. It was here in Havana that Cortez began to organize a household and to be treated as a lord. The first marshal of the household whom he appointed was a certain Guzman, who soon afterwards died or was killed by the Indians, and he had his camarero Rodrigo Ranguel and for Mayor Domo Juan de Caceres. When all this was settled, we got ready to embark, and the horses were divided among all the ships, and mangers were made for them, and a store of maize and hay put on board. I will now call to mind all the mares and horses that were shipped. The Captain Cortez, a vicious dark chestnut horse, which died as soon as we arrived at San Juan de Ulua, Pedro de Alvarado and Hernando Lopez de Alvia, a very good sorrel mare, good both for sport and as a charger. When we arrived at New Spain, Pedro de Alvarado bought the other half share in the mare, or took it by force. Alonso Hernandez Puerto Carrero, a gray mare, a very good charger, which Cortez bought for him with his gold buttons. Juan Velasquez de Leon, a very powerful gray mare, which we called La Robona, a very handy and good charger. Cristobal de Olid, a dark jester horse, fairly good. Francisco de Montejo and Alonso de Avia, a parched sorrel horse, no use for warfare. Francisco de Morla, a dark chestnut horse, very fast and very easily handled. Juan de Escalante, a light chestnut horse with three stockings, not much good. Diego de Orda, a gray mare, barren, tolerably good, but not fast. Gonzalo Dominguez, a wonderfully good horseman. A very good dark chestnut horse, a grand galloper. Pedro Gonzalez de Trujillo, a good chestnut horse, all chestnut, a very good goer. Moro, a settler at Bayamo, a dappled horse with stockings on the forefeet, very handy. Baena, a settler at Trinidad, a dappled horse almost black, no good for anything. Laris, a very good horseman, an excellent horse of rather light chestnut color. A very good goer. Ortiz the musician and Bartolome Garcia, who once owned gold mines. A very good dark horse called El Arriero. This was one of the best horses carried in the fleet. Juan Cedeno, a settler at Havana, a chestnut mare which foaled on board ship. This Juan Cedeno passed for the richest soldier in the fleet, for he came in his own ship with the mare and a negro in a store of cassava bread and salt pork, and at that time horses and negroes were worth their weight in gold, and that is the reason why more horses were not taken, for there were none to be bought. To make my story clear, I must go back and relate that when Diego Velasquez knew for certain that Francisco Verdugo not only refused to compel Cortez to leave the fleet, but together with Diego de Orda had helped him to get away, they say that he was so angry that he roared with rage, and said that Cortez was mutinous. He made up his mind to send orders to Pedro Barba, his lieutenant at Havana, and to Diego de Orda, to Juan Velasquez de Leon, who were his kinsmen, praying them neither for good nor ill to let the fleet get away, and to seize Cortez at once and send him under a strong guard to Santiago de Cuba. 
On the arrival of the messenger, it was known at once what he had brought with him, for by the same messenger, Cortez was advised what Velasquez was doing. It appears that a friar of the Order of Mercy wrote a letter to another friar of his order, named Bartolome de Olmedo, who was with us, and in that letter Cortez was informed of all that had happened. Not one of those to whom Diego Velasquez had written favored his proposal. Indeed, one and all declared for Cortez, and Lieutenant Pedro Barba above all, and all of us would have given our lives for Cortez. So that if in the town of Trinidad the orders of Velasquez were slighted, in the town of Havana they were absolutely ignored. Cortez wrote to Velasquez in the agreeable and complimentary terms which he knew so well how to use, and told him that he should set sail next day, and that he remained his humble servant. There was to be no parade of the forces until we arrived at Cozumel, Cortez altered the horses to be taken aboard ship, and he directed Pedro de Alvarado to go along the north coast in a good ship named the San Sebastian, and he told the pilot who was in charge to wait for him at Cape San Antonio, as all the ships would meet there and go in company to Cozumel. He also sent a messenger to Diego de Orda, who had gone along the north coast to collect supplies of food with orders to do the same and await his coming. On the 10th, February, 1519, after hearing Mass, they set sail along the south coast with nine ships and a company of gentlemen and soldiers whom I have mentioned, so that with the two ships absent from the north coast, there were eleven ships in all, including that which carried Pedro de Alvarado with seventy soldiers, and I traveled in his company. The pilot named Camacho, who was in charge of our ship, paid no attention to the orders of Cortez and went his own way we arrived at Cozumel two days before Cortez, and anchored in the port which I have often mentioned when telling about Grijalva's expedition. Cortez had not yet arrived, being delayed by the ship commanded by Francisco de Morla, having lost her rudder in bad weather. However, she was supplied with another rudder by one of the ships of the fleet, and all then came on in company. To go back to Pedro de Alvarado. As soon as we arrived in port, we went on shore with all the soldiers to the town of Cozumel, but we found no Indians there, as they had all fled. So we were ordered to go on to another town about a league distant, and there also the natives had fled and taken to the bush. But they could not carry off their property, and left behind their poultry and other things, and Pedro de Alvarado ordered forty of the fowls to be taken. In an idle house, there were some altar ornaments made of old cloths and some little chests containing diadems, idols, beads, and pendants of gold of poor quality, and here we captured two Indians and an Indian woman, and we returned to the town where we had disembarked. While we were there, Cortez arrived with all the fleet, and after taking up his lodging, the first thing he did was to order the pilot Camacho to be put in irons for not having waited warm at sea, as he had been ordered to do. When he saw the town without any people in it, and heard that Pedro de Alvarado had gone to the other town, and had taken fowls and cloths and other things of small value from the idols, and some gold which was half copper, he showed that he was very angry both at that and at the pilot for not having waited for him, and he reprimanded Pedro de Alvarado severely, and told him that we should never pacify the country in that way by robbing the natives of their property, and he sent for the two Indians, and the woman whom we had captured, and through Melcorejo, Julia Neo, his companion, was dead. The man we had bought from Cape Catoche, who understood the language well, he spoke to them, telling them to go, and summoned the caciques and Indians of their town, and he told them not to be afraid, and he ordered the gold and the cloths and all the rest to be given back to them. And for the fowls, which had already been eaten, he ordered them to be given beads and little bells, and in addition he gave each Indian a Spanish shirt, so they went off to summon the lord of the town, and the next day the cacique and all his people arrived, women and children and all the inhabitants of the town, and they went about among us as though they had been used to us all their lives, and Cortez ordered us not to annoy them in any way. Here in this island Cortez began to rule energetically, and our lord so favored him that whatever he put his hand to, it turned out well for him especially in pacifying the people and towns of these lands, as we shall see further on. When we had been in Cozumel three days, Cortez ordered a muster of his forces so as to see how many of us there were, and he found that we numbered five hundred and eight, not counting the shipmasters, pilots, and sailors, who numbered about one hundred. 
There were sixteen horses and mares, all fit to be used for sport or as chargers. There were eleven ships, both great and small, and one a sort of launch, which a certain Guine Norte brought laden with supplies. There were thirty-two crossbowmen and thirteen musketeers, and some brass guns and four falconets, and much powder and ball. After the review, Cortes ordered Mesa surnamed the Gunner, and Bartolome du Sagre and Arbenga, and a certain Catalan, who were all artillerymen, to keep their guns clean and in good order, and the ammunition ready for use. He appointed Francisco de Herdosca, who had been a soldier in Italy, to be captain of the artillery. He likewise ordered two crossbowmen named Juan Benitez and Pedro de Guzman, who were masters of the art of repairing crossbows, to see that every crossbow had two or three spare nuts and cords and four cords, and to be careful to keep them stored and to have smoothing tools, and to see that the men should practice at a target. He also ordered all the horses to be kept in good condition. Cortez sent for me and a Biscayan named Martin Ramos, and asked us what we thought about those words which the Indians of Campeche had used when we went there with Francisco Hernandez de Cordova, when they cried out, Castilian, Castilian. We again related to Cortez all that we had seen and heard about the matter, and he said that he had also often thought about it, and that perhaps there might be some Spaniards living in the country, and added, It seems to me that it would be well to ask these caciques of Cozumel if they know anything about them. So through Melcorejo, who already understood a little Spanish and knew the language of Cozumel very well, all the chiefs were questioned, and every one of them said that they had known of certain Spaniards, and gave descriptions of them, and said that some caciques who lived about two days' journey inland kept them as slaves. We were all delighted at this news, and Cortez told the caciques that they must go at once and summon the Spaniards, taking with them letters. The cacique advised Cortez to send a ransom to the owners who held these men as slaves, so that they should be allowed to come. And Cortez did so, and gave to the messengers all manner of beads. Then he ordered the two smallest vessels to be got ready under the command of Diego de Arda, and he sent them off to the coast near Cape Catoche, where the larger vessel was to wait for eight days, while the smaller vessel should go backwards and forwards and bring news of what was being done, for the land of Cape Catoche was only four leagues distant. In two days the letters were delivered to a Spaniard named Geronimo de Aguilar, for that we found to be his name. When he had read the letter and received the ransom of beads which we had sent to him, he was delighted, and carried the ransom to the cacique, his master, and begged leave to depart, and the cacique at once gave him leave to go wherever he pleased. Aguilar set out for the place five leagues distant, where his companion Gonzalo Guerrero was living, but when he read the letter to him, he answered, Brother Aguilar, I am married and have three children, and the Indians look on me as a cacique and a captain in wartime. You go, and God be with you, but I have my face tattooed and my ears pierced. What would the Spaniards say should they see me in the skies? And look how handsome these boys of mine are. For God's sake, give me those green beads you have brought, and I will give the beads to them and say that my brothers have sent them from my own country. And the Indian wife of Gonzalo spoke to Aguilar in her own tongue very angrily and said to him, What is this slave coming here for, talking to my husband? Go off with you and don't trouble us with any more words. When Jeronimo de Aguilar saw that Gonzalo would not accompany him, he went at once with the two Indian messengers to the place where the ship had been awaiting his coming. But when he arrived, he saw no ship, for she had already departed. The eight days during which Orda had been ordered to wait and one day more had already expired, and seeing that Aguilar had not arrived, Orda returned to Cozumel without bringing any news about that for which he had come. When Aguilar saw that there was no ship there, he became very sad, and returned to his master and to the town where he usually lived. When Cortez saw Orda return without success, or any news of the Spaniards or Indian messengers, he was very angry and said haughtily to Orda that he thought that he would have done better than to return without the Spaniards or any news of them, for it was quite clear that they were prisoners in that country. We embarked again and set sail on a day in the month of March, 1519, and went on our way in fair weather. At ten o'clock that same morning loud shouts were given from one of the ships, which tried to lay to and fired a shot so that all the vessels of the fleet might hear it, 
and when Cortez heard this, he at once checked the flagship, and seeing the ship commanded by Juan de Escalante bearing away and returning towards Cozumel, he cried out to the other ships which were near him, What is the matter? What is the matter? And a soldier named Dui de Zaragoza answered that Juan de Escalante's ship, with all the cassava bread on board, was sinking, and Cortez cried, Pray God that we suffer no such disaster. And he ordered the pilot Alaminos to make signal to all the other ships to return to Cozumel. When the Spaniard was a prisoner among the Indians, knew for certain that we had returned to Cozumel with the ships, he was very joyful and gave thanks to God. And he came in all haste with the two Indians who had carried the letters and ransom. And as he was able to pay well with the green beads we had sent him, he soon hired a canoe and six Indian rowers. When they arrived on the coast of Cozumel and were disembarking, some soldiers who had gone out hunting, for there were wild pigs on the island, told Cortez that a large canoe, which had come from the direction of Cape Catoche, had arrived near the town. Cortez sent Andre de Tapia and two other soldiers to go and see, for it was a new thing for Indians to come fearlessly in large canoes into our neighborhood. When Andre de Tapia saw that they were only Indians, he had once sent word to Cortez by a Spaniard that they were Cozumel Indians who had come in the canoe. As soon as the men had landed, one of them had words badly articulated and worse pronounced, cried, Dios y Santa Maria de Sevilla, and Tapia went at once to embrace him. Tapia soon brought the Spaniard to Cortez, but before he arrived where Cortez was standing, several Spaniards asked Tapia where the Spaniard was, although he was walking by his side for they could not distinguish him from an Indian, as he was naturally brown, and he had his hair shorn like an Indian slave, and carried a paddle on his shoulder. He was shod with one old sandal, and the other was tied to his belt. He had on a ragged old cloak, and a worse loincloth, with which he covered his nakedness, and he had tied up in a bundle in his cloak a book of hours, old and worn. When Cortez saw him in this state, he too was deceived like the other soldiers, and asked Tapia, where is the Spaniard? On hearing this, the Spaniard squatted down on his haunches, as the Indians do, and said, I am he. Cortez at once ordered him to be given a shirt and doublet and drawers, and a cape and sandals, for he had no other clothes, and asked him about himself and what his name was, and when he came to this country. The man replied, pronouncing with difficulty, that it was called Geronimo de Aguilar, a native of Essia, and that he had taken holy orders that eight years had passed since he and fifteen other men and two women left Darien for the island of Santo Domingo, and that the ship in which they sailed struck on the Alcaranes so that she could not be floated, and that he and his companions and the two women got into the ship's boat, thinking to reach the island of Cuba or Jamaica, but that the currents were very strong and carried them to this land and that the Calaciones of that district had divided them among themselves, and that many of his companions had been sacrificed to the idols, and that others had died of disease. And the women had died of overwork only a short time before, for they had been made to grind corn, that the Indians had intended him for a sacrifice, but that one night he escaped and fled to the cacique with whom since then he had been living, and that none were left of all his party except himself and a certain Gonzalo Guerrero, whom he had gone to summon but who would not come. Cortez questioned Aguilar about the country and the towns, but Aguilar replied that having been a slave, he knew only about hewing wood and drawing water, digging in the fields, that he had only once traveled as far as four leagues from home when he was sent with a load, but as it was heavier than he could carry, he fell ill. Not that he understood that there were many towns. When questioned about Gonzalo Guerrero, he said that he was married and had three sons, and that his face was tattooed and his ears and lower lip were pierced, that he was a seaman and a native of Palos, and that the Indians considered him to be very valiant, that when a little more than a year ago a captain and three vessels arrived at Cape Catoche, it was at the suggestion of Guerrero that the Indians attacked them, and that he was there himself in the company of the cacique of the large town. When Cortez heard this, he exclaimed, I wish I had him in my hands, for it will never do to leave him here. On the advice of Aguilar, the caciques asked Cortez to give them a letter of recommendation, so that if any other Spaniards came to that port, they would treat the Indians well, and do them no harm, and this letter was given to them. On the 4th of March, 1519, 
with the good fortune to carry such a useful and faithful interpreter along with us, Cortez gave orders for us to embark in the same order as before, and with the same lantern signals by night. We sailed along in good weather until at nightfall a head wind struck us so fiercely that the ships were dispersed and there was great danger of being driven ashore. Thank God, by midnight the weather moderated, and the ships got together again, excepting the vessel under the command of Juan Velasquez de Leon. However, when she still failed to appear, it was agreed that the whole fleet should go back and search for the missing ship, and we found her at anchor in a bay which was a great relief to us all. We stayed in that bay for a day, and we lowered two boats and went on shore and found farms and maize plantations, and there were four quay, which are the houses of their idols. And there were many idols in them, nearly all of them figures of tall women, so we called that place the Punta de las Mujeres. On the 12th March, 1519, we arrived with all the fleet at the Rio de Grialva, which is also called Tabasco, and as we already knew from our experience with Grialva that vessels of large size could not enter into the river, the larger vessels were anchored out at sea. And from the smaller vessels and boats, all the soldiers were landed at the Cape of the Palms, as they were in Grialva's time, which was about half a league distant from the town of Tabasco. The river, the river banks, and the mangrove thickets were swarming with Indians, at which those of us who had not been here in Grialva's time were much astonished. In addition to this, there were assembled in the town more than 12,000 warriors, all prepared to make war on us, for at this time the town was of considerable importance, and other large towns were subject to it. They had all made preparation for war and were well supplied with arms. The reason for this was that the people of Champoton and Lazaro and the other towns in that neighborhood had looked upon the people of Tabasco as cowards, and had told them to their faces, because they had given Grialva the gold jewels. And they said that they were too faint-hearted to attack us, although they had more towns and more warriors than the people of Champoton and Lazaro. This they said to annoy them, and added that they in their towns had attacked us and killed fifty-six of us. So on account of these taunts which had been uttered, the people of Tabasco had determined to take up arms. When Cortez saw them drawn up ready for war, he told Aguilar, the interpreter, to ask the Indians who passed near us in a large canoe, and who looked like chiefs, what they were so much disturbed about, and to tell them that we had not come to do them any harm, but were willing to give them some of the things we had brought with us, and to treat them like brothers, and we prayed them not to begin a war as they would regret it, and as much else was said to them about keeping the peace. However, the more Aguilar talked to them, the more violent they became, and they said that they would kill us all if we entered their town and that it was fortified all around with forces and barricades of large trunks of trees. Aguilar spoke to them again and asked them to keep the peace and allow us to take water and barter our goods with them for food and permit us to tell the Calachones things which would be of to their advantage and to the service of God our Lord. But they still persisted in telling us that if we advanced beyond the palm trees, they would kill us. When Cortez saw the state of affairs, he ordered the boats and small vessels to be got ready, and ordered three cannon to be placed in each boat, and divided the crossbowmen and musketeers among the boats. We remembered that when we were here with Grialva, we had found a narrow path which ran across some streams from the palm grove to the town, and Cortez ordered three soldiers to find out in the night if that path might run right up to the houses, and not to delay in bringing the news and these men found out that it did lead there. After making a thorough examination of our surroundings, the rest of the day was spent in arranging how and in what order we were to go in the boats. The next morning we had our arms in readiness, and after hearing mass, Cortez ordered the captain Alonso de Avila and a hundred soldiers among whom were ten crossbowmen to go by the little path which led to the town and as soon as he heard the guns fired to attack the town on one side while he attacked it on the other, Cortez himself and all the other captains and soldiers went to the boats and light draft vessels up the river. When the Indian warriors who were on the banks and among the mangroves saw that we were really on the move, they came after us with a great many canoes with intent to prevent our going ashore at the landing place, and the whole river bank appeared to be covered with Indian warriors carrying all the different arms which they use, and blowing trumpets and shells and sounding drums, 
When Cortez saw how matters stood, he ordered us to wait a little, and not to fire any shots from guns or crossbows or cannon, for as he wished to be justified on all that he might do, he made another appeal to the Indians through the interpreter Aguilar, in the presence of the king's notary, Diego de Godoy, asking the Indians to allow us to land and take water and speak to them about God and about his majesty, and adding that should they make war on us, that if in defending ourselves some should be killed and others hurt, theirs would be the fault and the burden, and it would not lie with us. But they went on threatening that if we landed, they would kill us. Then they boldly began to let fly arrows at us, and made signals with their drums, and like valiant men they surrounded us with their canoes, and they all attacked us with such a shower of arrows that they kept us in the water in some parts up to our waists. As there was much mud and swamp at that place, we could not easily get clear of it, and so many Indians fell on us, that what with some hurling their lances with all their might and others shooting arrows at us, we could not reach the land as soon as we wished. While Cortez was fighting, he lost his shoe in the mud, and could not find it again, and he got on shore with one foot bare. Presently someone picked the shoe out of the mud, and he put it on again. While this was happening to Cortez, all of us captains, as well as soldiers, with the cry of, Santiago, fell upon the Indians and forced them to retreat. But they did not fall back far, as they sheltered themselves behind great barriers and stockades formed of thick logs until we pulled them apart and got to one of the small gateways of the town. There we attacked them again, and we pushed them along through a street to where the other defenses had been erected, and there they turned on us and met us face to face and fought most valiantly, making the greatest efforts, shouting and whistling and crying out, Alcalacione, Alcalacione, which in their language meant in order to kill or capture our captain. While we were thus surrounded by them, Alonso de Avia and his soldiers came up from behind. As I have already said, they came from the palm grove by land and could not arrive sooner on account of the swamps and creeks. Their delay was really unavoidable, just as we also had been delayed over the summons of the Indians to surrender. And in breaking openings in the barricades, so as to enable us to attack them. Now we all joined together to drive the enemy out of their strongholds, and we compelled them to retreat. But like brave warriors, they kept on shooting showers of arrows and fire-hardened darts, and never turned their backs on us until we gained a great court with chambers and large halls, and three idle houses, where they had already carried all the goods they possessed. Cortez then ordered us to halt, and not to follow on and overtake the enemy in their flight. There and then Cortez took possession of that land for his majesty, performing the act in his majesty's name. It was done in this way. He drew his sword, and as a sign of possession, he made three cuts in a huge tree called a Seiba, which stood up in the court of that great square, and cried that if any person should raise objection, that he would defend the right with the sword and shield which he held in his hands. All of us soldiers who were present when this happened cried out that he did right in taking possession of the land in his majesty's name, and that we would aid him should any person say otherwise. This act was done in the presence of the royal notary, the partisans of Diego Velasquez chose to grumble at this act of taking possession. I call to mind that in that hard-fought attack which the Indians made on us, they wounded fourteen soldiers, and they gave me an arrow wound in the thigh, but it was only a slight wound, and we found eighteen Indians dead in the water where we disembarked. We slept there in the great square that night, with guards and sentinels on the alert. The next morning, Cortez ordered Pedro de Alvarado to set out in command of a hundred soldiers, fifteen of them with guns and crossbows, to examine the country inland for a distance of two leagues, and to take Melcorejo, the interpreter, in his company. When Melcorejo was looked for, he could not be found, as he had run off with the people of Tabasco, and it appears that the day before he had left the Spanish clothes to have been given to him, hung up in the palm grove and had fled by night in a canoe. Cortez was much annoyed at his flight, fearing that he would tell things to his fellow countrymen to our disadvantage. Well, let him go, it was a bit of bad luck, and let us get back to our story. Cortez also sent the captain Francisco de Lugo in another direction, with a hundred soldiers, to all the musketeers and crossbowmen, 
with instructions not to go beyond two leagues and to return to the camp to sleep. When Francisco de Lugo and his company had marched about a league from camp, he came on a great host of Indian archers, carrying lances and shields, drums and standards, and they made straight for a company of soldiers and surrounded them on all sides. They were so numerous and shot their arrows so deftly that it was impossible to withstand them, and they hurled their fire-hardened darts and cast stones from their slings in such numbers that they fell like hail, and they attacked our men with their two-handed knife-like swords. Stoutly, as Francisco de Lugo and his soldiers fought, they could not ward off the enemy, and when this was clear to them, while still keeping a good formation, they began to retreat towards the camp. A certain Indian, a swift and daring runner, had been sent off to the camp to beg Cortez to come to their assistance. Meanwhile, Francisco de Lugo, by careful management of his musketeers and crossbowmen, some loading while others fired, and by occasional charges, was able to hold his own against all the squadrons attacking him. Let us leave him in the dangerous situation I have described, and return to Captain Pedro de Alvarado, who, after marching about a league, came on a creek which was very difficult to cross, and it pleased God our Lord so to lead him that he should return by another road in the direction where Francisco de Lugo was fighting. When he heard the reports of the muskets and the great din of drums and trumpets and the shouts and whistles of the Indians, he knew that there must be a battle going on. So with the greatest haste, but in good order, he ran towards the cries and shots and found Captain Francisco de Lugo and his men fighting with their faces to the enemy and five of the enemy lying dead. As soon as he joined forces with Francisco de Lugo, they turned on the Indians and drove them back, but they were not able to put them to flight and the Indians followed our men right up to the camp. In like manner, other companies of warriors had attacked us where Cortez was guarding the wounded, but we soon drove them off with our guns, which laid many of them low, and with our good sword play. When Cortez heard of Francisco de Lugo's peril from the Cuban Indian who came to beg for help, we presently went to his assistance, and we met the two captains with their companies about half a league from the camp. Two soldiers of Francisco de Lugo's company were killed, and eight wounded, and three of Pedro de Alvarado's company were wounded. When we arrived in camp, we buried the dead and tended the wounded, and stationed sentinels and kept a strict watch. In those skirmishes, we killed fifteen Indians and captured three, one of whom seemed to be a chief. And through Aguilar, our interpreter, we asked them why they were so mad as to attack us, and that they could see that we should kill them if they attacked us again. Then one of these Indians was sent to with some beads to give to the caciques and bring them to peace. And that messenger told us that the Indian Malcorejo, whom he had brought from Cape Catoche, went to the chiefs the night before and counseled them to fight us day and night and said that they would conquer us as we are few in number. So it turned out that we had brought an enemy with us instead of a help. This Indian whom we dispatched with the message went off and never returned. From the other two Indian prisoners, Aguilar, the interpreter, learnt from certain that by the next day the caciques from all the neighboring towns of the province would have assembled with all their forces, ready to make war on us, and that they would come and surround our camp, for that was Melcarejo's advice to them. As soon as Cortez knew this for certain, he ordered all the horses to be landed from the ships without delay, and the crossbow of musketeers and all of his soldiers, even those who were wounded, to have our arms ready for use. When the horses were brought on shore, they were very stiff and afraid to move, for they had been many days on board ship. But the next day they moved quite freely. At that time it happened that six or seven soldiers, young men and otherwise in good health, suffered from pains in their loins, so they could not stand on their feet and had to be carried on men's backs. We did not know what the sickness came from, some say that they fell ill on account of the quilted cotton armor, which they never took off, but wore day and night. And because in Cuba they had lived daintily and were not used to hard work, so in the heat they fell ill. Cortez ordered them not to remain on land, but to be taken at once on board ship. The best horses and riders were chosen to form the cavalry, and the horses had little bells attached to their breastplates. The men were ordered not to stop to spear those who were down, but to aim their lances at the faces of the enemy. Thirteen gentlemen were chosen to go on horseback with Cortez in command of them, and I here record their names. Cortez, Cristóbal de Olid, Pedro de Alvarado, 
Alonso Hernández Puerto Carrero, Juan de Escalante, Francisco de Montejo, and Alonso de Avila, to whom was given the horse belonging to Ortiz the musician and Bartolome Garcia, for neither of these men were good horsemen. Juan Velasquez de Leon, Francisco de Morla, and Lares, the good horseman, Gonzalo Dominguez, an excellent horseman, Moron of Bayamo, and Pedro Gonzalez of Trujillo. Cortez selected all these gentlemen and went himself as their captain. Cortez ordered Mesa the artillerymen to have his guns ready, and he placed Diego de Orda in command of us foot soldiers, and he also had command of the musketeers and bowmen, for he was no horseman. Very early the next day, which was the day of Nuestra Señora de Marzo, Lady Day, 25th March, after hearing Mass, which was said by Fray Bartolomé de Olmedo, we formed in order under our standard bearer and marched to some large savannas where Francisco de Lugo and Pedro de Alvarado had been attacked. About a league distant from the camp we had left, and that savanna and township was called Cintla and was subject to Tabasco. Cortez and the horsemen were separated a short distance from us on account of some swamps which could not be crossed by the horses, and as we were marching along, we came on the whole force of Indian warriors who were on their way to attack us in our camp. It was near the town of Sintla that we met them on an open plain. As they approached us, their squadrons were so numerous that they covered the whole plain, and they rushed on us like mad dogs completely surrounding us, and they let fly such a cloud of arrows, javelins, and stones, that on the first assault they wounded over seventy of us. And fighting hand to hand, they did us great damage with their lances, and one soldier fell dead at once from an arrow wound in the ear, and they kept on shooting and wounding us. With our muskets and crossbows and with good sword play, we did not fail as stout fighters, and when they came to feel the edge of our swords, little by little, they fell back. But it was only so as to shoot at us in greater safety. Mesa, our artillerymen, killed many of them with his cannon, for they were formed in great squadrons, and they did not open out so that he could fire at them as he pleased. But with all the hurts and wounds which we gave them, we could not drive them off. I said to Diego de Arda, it seems to me that we ought to close up and charge them. For in truth, they suffered greatly from the strokes and thrusts of our swords, and that was why they fell away from us, both from fear of these swords and the better to shoot their arrows and hurl their javelins and the hail of stones. Orda replied that it was not very good advice, for there were three hundred Indians to every one of us, and that we could not hold out against such a multitude. So there we stood, enduring their attack. However, we did agree to get as near as we could to them, as I had advised Orda, so as to give them a bad time with our swordsmanship, and they suffered so much from it that they retreated towards a swamp. During all this time, Cortez and his horsemen failed to appear, although we greatly longed for him, and we feared that by chance some disaster had befallen him. I remember that when we fired shots, the Indians gave great shouts and whistles, and threw dust and rubbish into the air so that we should not see the damage done to them, and they sounded their trumpets and drums and shouted and whistled and cried, Alala! Alala! Just at this time we caught sight of our horsemen, and as the great Indian host was crazed with his attack on us, it did not at once perceive them coming up behind their backs, and as the plain was level ground, and the horsemen were good riders, and many of the horses were very handy and fine gallopers, they came quickly on the enemy and speared them as they chose. As soon as we saw the horsemen, we fell on the Indians with such energy that... With us attacking on one side and the horsemen on the other, they soon turned tail. The Indians thought that the horse and its rider was all one animal, for they had never seen horses up to this time. The savannas and fields were crowded with Indians running to take refuge in the thick woods nearby. After we defeated the enemy, Cortez told us that he had not been able to come to us sooner as there was a swamp in the way, and he had to fight his way through another force of warriors before he could reach us, and the three horsemen and five horses had been wounded. As it was Lady Day, we gave to the town which was afterwards founded here the name of Santa Maria de la Victoria, on account of this great victory being won on Our Lady's Day. This was the first battle that we fought at a Cortez in New Spain. After this, we bound up the hurts of the wounded with cloths, for we had nothing else, and we doctored the horses by searing their wounds with the fat from the body of a dead Indian, which we cut up to get out the fat, and we went to look at the dead lying on the plain. There were more than eight hundred of them, the greater number killed by thrusts, 
the others by the cannon, muskets, and crossbows, and many were stretched on the ground half-dead. Where the horsemen had passed, numbers of them lay dead or groaning from their wounds. The battle lasted over an hour, and the Indians fought all the time like brave warriors until the horsemen came up. We took five prisoners, two of them captains. As it was late and we had had enough of fighting and we had not eaten anything, we returned to our camp. Then we buried the two soldiers who had been killed, one by a wound in the ear and the other by a wound in the throat. And we seared the wounds of the others and of the horses with the fat of the Indian. And after posting sentinels and guards, we had supper and rested. When Aguilar spoke to the prisoners, he found out from what they said that they were fit persons to be sent as messengers, and he advised Cortez to free them so they might go and talk to the caciques of the town. These two messengers were given green and blue beads, and Aguilar spoke many pleasant and flattering words to them, telling them that they had nothing to fear as we wished to treat them like brothers, that it was their own fault that they had made war on us, and that now they had better collect together all the caciques of the different towns as we wished to talk to them and he gave them much other advice in a gentle way so as to gain their goodwill. The messengers went off willingly and spoke to the caciques and chief men and told them all we wished them to know about our desire for peace. When our envoys had been listened to, it was settled among them that fifteen Indian slaves, all with stained faces and ragged cloaks and loincloths, should at once be sent to us with fowls and baked fish and maize cakes. When these men came before Cortez, he received them graciously, but Aguilar the interpreter asked them rather angrily why they had come with their faces in that state. It looked more as though they came to fight than to treat for peace, and he told them to go back to the caciques and inform them that if they wished for peace in the way we offered it, chieftains should come and treat for it, as was always the custom, and that they should not send slaves. But even these painted-faced slaves were treated with consideration by us, and blue beads were sent by them in sign of peace, and to soothe their feelings. The next day thirty Indian chieftains, clad in good cloaks, came to visit us, and brought fowls, fish, fruit, and maize cakes, and asked leave from Cortez to burn and bury the bodies of the dead who had fallen in the recent battles, so that they should not smell badly or be eaten by lions and tigers. Permission was at once given to them, and they hastened to bring many people to bury and burn the bodies according to their customs. Cortez learned from the caciques that over eight hundred men were missing, not counting those who had been carried off wounded. They said that they could not tarry with us either to discuss the matter or make peace, for on the morrow the chieftains and leaders of all the towns would have assembled, and then they would agree about a peace. As Cortez was very sagacious about everything, he said, laughing to us soldiers who happened to be in his company, do you know, gentlemen, that it seems to me that the Indians are terrified at the horses, and may think that they and the cannon alone make war on them? I have thought of something which will confirm this belief, and that it is to bring the mare belonging to Juan Cedeno, which pulled the other day on board ship, and tie her up where I am now standing. Also to bring the stallion of Ortiz the musician, which is very excitable, near enough to send the mare and when he has sent it or to lead each of them all separately so the caciques who are coming shall not hear the horse neighing as they approach not until they are standing before me and talking to me we did just as cortez ordered and brought the horse and mare and the horse soon detected the scent of her in cortez quarters in addition to this cortez ordered the largest cannon that we possessed to be loaded with a large ball and a good charge of powder about midday forty indians arrived all of them caciques of good bearing, wearing rich mantles. They saluted Cortez and all of us, and brought incense and fumigated all of us who were present, and they asked pardon for their past behavior, and said that henceforth they would be friendly. Cortez, through Aguilar the interpreter, answered them in a rather grave manner, as though he were angry, that they well knew how many times he had asked them to maintain peace, that the fault was theirs, and that now they deserved to be put to death they and all the people of their towns. But, as we were vassals of a great king and lord named the Emperor Don Carlos, who had sent us to these countries and ordered us to help and favor those who would enter his royal service, that if they were now as well disposed as they said they were, that we would take this course, but that if they were not, some of those Tepustles 
would jump out and kill them. They call iron Tabusle in their language, for some of the Tabusleys were still angry because they had made war on us. At this moment, the order was secretly given to put a match to the cannon, which had been loaded, and it went off with such a thunderclap as was wanted, and the ball went buzzing over the hills, and as it was midday and very still, it made a great noise, and the caciques were terrified on hearing it, as they had never seen anything like it. They believed that Cortez had told them the truth. Then Cortez told them through Aguilar not to be afraid, for he had given orders that no harm should be done to them. Just then, the horse that had scented the mare was brought and tied up not far distant from where Cortez was talking to the caciques, and the horse began to paw the ground and neigh and become wild with excitement, looking all the time toward the Indians and the place whence the scent of the mare had reached him, and the caciques thought that he was roaring at them, and they were terrified. When Cortez observed their state of mind, he rose from his seat and went to the horse and told two orderlies to lead it away, and said to the Indians that he had told the horse not to be angry, as they were friendly and wished to make peace. While this was going on, there arrived more than thirty Indian carriers, who brought a meal of fowls and fish and fruits and other food. Cortez had a long conversation with these chieftains and caciques, and they told him that they would all come on the next day, and would bring a present and would discuss other matters, and then they went away quite contented. Early the next morning, many caciques and chiefs of Tabasco and the neighboring towns arrived and paid great respect to us all, and they brought a present of gold, consisting of four diadems and some gold lizards, and two ornaments like little dogs, and earrings, and five ducks, and two masks with Indian faces, and two gold soles for sandals, and some other things of little value. I do not remember how much the things were worth, and they brought cloth, such as they make and wear, which was quilted stuff. This present, however, was worth nothing in comparison with the twenty women that were given us, among them one very excellent woman called Doña Marina, for so she was named when she became a Christian. Cortez received this present with pleasure, and went aside with all the caciques and with Aguilar the interpreter to hold converse, and he told them that he gave them thanks for what they had brought with them, but there was one thing that he must ask of them, namely that they should reoccupy the town with all their people, women and children, and he wished to see it repeopled within two days, for he would recognize that as a sign of true peace. The cacique sent at once to summon all the inhabitants with their women and children, and within two days they were again settled in the town. One other thing Cortez asked of the chiefs, and that was to give up their idols and sacrifices, and this they said they would do. And through Aguilar, Cortez told them as well as he was able about matters concerning our holy faith, how we were Christians and worshipped one true and only God, and he showed them an image of Our Lady with her precious son in her arms, and explained to them that we paid the greatest reverence to it, as it was the image of the mother of our Lord God who was in heaven. The caciques replied that they liked the look of the great Telesiguata, for in their language great ladies are called Telesiguatas, and begged that she might be given them to keep in their town, and Cortez said that the image should be given to them, and ordered them to make a well-constructed altar, and this they did at once. The next morning Cortez ordered two of our carpenters, named Alonso Yanye and Alvaro Lopez, to make a very tall cross. When all this had been settled, Cortez asked the caciques what was their reason for attacking us three times when it would ask them to keep the peace. The chief replied that he had already asked pardon for their acts, and had been forgiven, that the cacique of Champoton, his brother, had advised it, and that he feared to be accused of cowardice, for he had already been reproached and dishonored for not having attacked the other captain who had come with four ships. He must have meant Juan de Grijalva. And he also said that the Indian whom we had brought as an interpreter, who escaped in the night, had advised them to attack us both by day and night. Cortez then ordered this man to be brought before him without fail, but they replied that when he saw that the battle was going against them, he had taken to flight, and they knew not where he was, although search had been made for him. But we came to know that they had offered him as a sacrifice, because his counsel had cost them so dear. Cortez also asked them where they procured their gold and jewels, and they replied from the direction of the setting sun, and said, Culua and Mexico. 
and as we did not know what Mexico and Kulua meant, we paid little attention to it. Then we brought another interpreter named Francisco, whom we had captured during Grijalva's expedition, who has already been mentioned by me, but he understood nothing of the Tabasco language, only that of Kulua, which is the Mexican tongue. By means of signs, he told Cortez the Kulua was far ahead, and he repeated, Mexico, which we did not understand. So the talk ceased until the next day, when the sacred image of Our Lady and the cross were set up on the altar, and we all paid reverence to them, and Padre Fray Bartolome de Olmedo said Mass, and all the caciques and chiefs were present, and we gave the name of Santa Maria de la Victoria to the town, and by this name the town of Tabasco is now called. The same friar, with Aguilar as interpreter, preached many good things about our holy faith to the twenty Indian women who had been given us, and immediately afterwards they were baptized. One Indian lady who was given to us here was christened Doña Marina, and she was truly a great chieftainess, and the daughter of great caciques, and the mistress of vassals, and thus her appearance clearly showed. Later on I will relate why it was, and in what manner she was brought here. Cortez allotted one of the women to each of his captains, and Doña Marina, as she was good-looking and intelligent and without embarrassment, he gave to Alonso Hernández Puerto Carrero. When Puerto Carrero went to Spain, Doña Marina lived with Cortez, and bore him a son named Don Martín Cortez. We remained five days in this town, to look after the wounded and those who were suffering from pain in the loins, from which they all recovered. Furthermore, Cortez drew the caciques to him by kindly converse, and told them how their master, the emperor, whose vassals we were, had under his orders many great lords, and that it would be well for them also to render him obedience, and that then, whatever they might be in need of, whether it was our protection or any other necessity, if they would make it known to him, no matter where he might be, he would come to their assistance. The caciques all thanked him for this, and thereupon all declared themselves the vassals of our great emperor. These were the first vassals to render submission to his majesty in New Spain. Cortez then ordered the caciques to come with their women and children early the next day, which was Palm Sunday, to the altar, to pay homage to the holy image of Our Lady and to the cross, and at the same time Cortez ordered them to send six Indian carpenters to accompany our carpenters to the town of Sintla, there to cut a cross on a great tree called a Seba, which grew there, and they did it so that it might last a long time, for as the bark is renewed, the cross will show there forever. When this was done, he ordered the Indians to get ready all the canoes that they owned to help us to embark, for we wished to set sail on that holy day, because the pilots had come to tell Cortez that the ships ran a great risk from a norther, which is a dangerous gale. The next day, early in the morning, all the caciques and chiefs came in their canoes with all their women and children, and stood in the court where we had placed the church and cross, and many branches of tree had already been cut ready to be carried in the procession. Then caciques beheld us all, Cortez, as well as the captains, and every one of us marching together with the greatest reverence in a devout procession, and the Padre de la Merced, and the priest Juan Diaz, clad in their vestments, said Mass, and we paid reverence to and kissed the Holy Cross, while the caciques and Indians stood looking on at us. When our solemn festival was over, the chiefs approached and offered Cortez ten fowls and baked fish and vegetables, and we took leave of them, and Cortez again commended to their care the holy image and the sacred crosses, and told them always to keep the place clean and well swept, and to deck the cross with garlands, and to reverence it, and then they would enjoy good health and bountiful harvest. It was growing late when we got on board ship, and the next day, Monday, we set sail in the morning, and with a fair wind laid our course for San Juan de Ulua, keeping close in shore all the time. As we sailed along in fine weather, we soldiers who knew the coast would say to Cortez, Signor, over there is La Rambla, which the Indians call Ayagualulco. And soon afterwards we arrived off Tonala, which we called San Antonio, and we pointed out to him. Further on we showed him the great river of Coatzagualcos, and he saw the lofty snow-capped mountains, and then the Sierra of San Martín. And further on we pointed out the split rock, which is a great rock standing out in the sea with a mark on the top of it which gives it the appearance of a seat. Again further on we showed him the Rio de Alvarado, which Pedro de Alvarado entered when we were with Grijalva, 
and then we came in sight of the Rio de Banderas, where we had gained and barter the sixteen thousand dollars. Then we showed him the Isla Blanca, and told him there lay the Isla Verde, and close in shore we saw the Isla de Sacrificios, where we found the altars and the Indian victims in Grijalva's time, and at last our good fortune brought us to San Juan de Ulua, soon after midday on Holy Thursday. Before telling about the great Montezuma and his famous city of Mexico and the Mexicans, I wish to give some account of Doña Marina, who from her childhood had been the mistress and casica of towns and vassals. It happened in this way. Her father and mother were chiefs and caciques of a town called Painala, which had other towns subject to it, and stood about eight leagues from the town of Coatzacoalcos. Her father died while she was still a little child, and her mother married another cacique, a young man, and bore him a son. It seems that the father and mother had a great affection for this son, and it was agreed between them that he should succeed to their honors when their days were done. So that there should be no impediment to this, they gave the little girl, Doña Marina, to some Indians from Zicalango, and this they did by night so as to escape observation. And they then spread the report that she had died, and as it happened at this time that a child of one of their Indian slaves died, they gave out that it was their daughter and the heiress who was dead. The Indians of Chicalango gave the child to the people of Tabasco, and the Tabasco people gave her to Cortez. I myself knew her mother, and the old woman's son and her half-brother, when he was already grown up and ruled the town jointly with his mother, for the second husband of the old lady was dead. When they became Christians, the old lady was called Marta, and her son Lazaro. I knew all this very well, because in the year 1523, after the conquest of Mexico and the other provinces, when Cristobal de Olid revolted in Honduras, and Cortes was on his way there, he passed through Coatzalcoalcos, and I and the greater number of the settlers of that town accompanied him on that expedition, as I shall relate in the proper time and place. As Doña Marino proved herself such an excellent woman and good interpreter throughout the wars in New Spain, Tlaxcala, and Mexico, as I shall show later on, Cortes always took her with him, and during that expedition she was married to a gentleman named Juan Jaramillo at the town of Orizaba. Doña Marina was a person of the greatest importance, and was obeyed without question by the Indians throughout New Spain. When Cortes was in the town of Coatzacoalcos, he sent to summon to his presence all the caciques of that province in order to make them a speech about our holy religion and about their good treatment, and among the caciques who assembled was the mother of Doña Marina and her half-brother, Lazaro. Some time before this, Doña Marina had told me that she belonged to that province, and that she was the mistress of vassals, and Cortes also knew it well, as did Aguilar the interpreter. In such a manner it was that mother, daughter, and son came together, and it was easy enough to see that she was the daughter from the strong likeness she bore to her mother. These relations were in great fear of Doña Marina, for they thought that she had sent for them to put them to death they were weeping. When Doña Marina saw them in tears, she consoled them and told them to have no fear, that when they had given her over to the men from Chicalango, they knew not what they were doing, and she forgave them for doing it. And she gave them many jewels of gold and raiment, and told them to return to their town, and said that God had been very gracious to her in freeing her from the worship of idols, and making her a Christian and letting her bear a son to her lord and master Cortez, and in marrying her to such a gentleman as Juan Aramillo, who was now her husband, that she would rather serve her husband and Cortez than anything else in the world, and would not exchange her place to be cacica of all the provinces in New Spain. Doña Marina knew the language of Coatzacoalcos, which is that common to Mexico, and she knew the language of Tabasco, as did also Jerónimo de Aguilar, who spoke the language of Yucatan and Tabasco, which is one and the same. So these two could understand one another clearly, and Aguilar translated into Castilian for Cortes. This was the great beginning of our conquests, and thus, thanks be to God, things prospered with us. I have made a point of explaining this matter, because without the help of Doña Marina, we could not have understood the language of New Spain and Mexico. End of chapter 1 I hope you've enjoyed this reading. There will be more to come, but not tonight.